Good morning. I'm glad to see you. I tell you, I've always loved you folks, and yes, I'll love you for many more years. I'm here because I promised so many people I would come back. I saw somebody at the funeral home, and they wanted to know if I'd come back after a few months ago, and I said, Lord willing, I'll be back. And then I saw some more at Kroger's down here. No, not Kroger's, but Walmart's. And, and then of all things, I got some telephone calls from you saying, will you come back? I said, Lord willing, I'll be back. And when Brother Mike called me here a couple of weeks ago, said they were having a deacon's meeting and wondered if I could work it out. And, uh, you know, I was already scheduled to preach somewhere else. And of all things, I got a supply to supply for me so I could come here. I don't know whether it's going to be worth it or not, but I'm glad I'm here anyway, and I'm glad to see you. Some of the happiest moments I ever had in my ministry was when I was in your interim pastor. We had such a great time together. That's all there is to it. And I remember you were going to vote on a man, and I thought you were going to call him, and I was sitting here on the first row with him and even asked him, if you get the call this Wednesday, when will you be leaving or coming up here? And I said, I'm just trying to plan my own life. And he said, well... It'd probably be about three or four weeks, and I said, that's great. And lo and behold, after that business meeting, I got a couple of calls and said, Brother Hooten, you're going to have to stay a little while. We didn't call him. And I said, well, I thought you would, and then I heard a number of you say that following Sunday, we didn't call him because we knew you'd leave. And I tell you, I don't care who the preacher is. You're glad to hear that. But uh, I stayed, I think, another year after that. But we had a great time together, and I thank God. And you didn't, didn't disappoint me because you're sitting in the same place you were sitting the last time I was here. Uh, he tried to fool me, and I, know, I think I told you one time, I always said that to my folks here at Hickory Grove. And one Sunday, the chairman deacons had told everybody to sit somewhere else. It drove me crazy. I got up and these people were sitting over here and back and forth and some in the balcony. And the only way we know as preachers whether you're here or not is the fact you sit in the same seat every Sunday. So I look down and see the first row. I know somebody's gone this morning if I'd been here and they been sitting there. But thank you for coming and thank you for letting me be here with you this morning. This is a great day and I know you're having a combined service and I know the Lord will bless us and I want you to continue to pray for me. I haven't had a vacation this, this year. I have preached every Sunday, as I recall, since January. The Lord just continues to, to work out open doors, and I try to be faithful to him. But he's been good to me. There's no doubt about that. I uh, don't know how long I'll be able to do these things, but nevertheless, I'm grateful for the privilege of just sharing the the Word of God, and I thank you for giving me that opportunity even this morning. I hope you, you brought your Bibles with you. I'm going to ask you to turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus. I remember the first time I went down to Cynthia Anabaptist to preach for those people. I was bringing a message, not this one, but I was bringing a message from the Old Testament. And somebody said after the service, nobody ever preaches from the Old Testament anymore. But I'm one of those strange preachers that still preach new as well as old. So I'll ask you to turn to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. How many brought your Bibles? I want to see that here at the end of the year. Hold them up high. Pretty good. But there are three hymn books you held back there. I know the difference. <laughs> I might be losing my my hair but I, I haven't lost my sight yet but I want you Exodus 32 and verse 25 and one thing I think I always tried to teach you is the fact that even in New Testament days during the time of Jesus whenever anyone would hand any dignitary the Torah or the Old Testament it was so holy the, the Bible was so holy to them they would always stand in reverence to the word of God Will you do that this morning with me, please? And you can listen to me as I, I begin reading with the 25th verse. <clears throat> and when Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, 
who is on the Lord's side, let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about three thousand men. Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. Thank you. you may be seated. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. I tell you, I enjoyed that uh, guitar duet this morning. Didn't you enjoy that? Would you believe I had to come up here Wednesday night and go over that with them so they'd get it right? I just said, would you believe that? I didn't say I did it. But we're going to the Lord in prayer, and I think you remember I said, God has a telephone number, and it's Jeremiah 33.3. Remember that, Jeremiah 33.3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now think about that. God said, call unto me, I will answer thee, I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. How many of you have a prayer request on your heart this morning? Would you just raise your hand, burden of your heart, praying for anybody? Let's bow together as we pray. So many of you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the tremendous privilege that we have of just sharing together and opening the pages of your word. And we just pray that you'll speak to our hearts and we pray that we'll be open and receptive to your leadership. And after we know your will, we pray that we might have the courage to follow it. Thank you for this church. And we pray that you'll continue to use them as a lighthouse in this community, always showing forth the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We continue to pray that you'll lead us together. We fail you so often, but we thank you for your forgiveness. And we pray that the message this hour will be preached with power and simplicity that Perhaps even a child might be able to understand it because we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Beloved, I don't know about you, but I've heard a lot of people say, you know, it just doesn't seem like Christmas anymore. It's certainly not like Christmases that we used to have many years ago. And there's a reason for that. We are having a tremendous fight for our faith. In fact, before I went to sleep last night, I read the headlines in Fox News that said how many Christians were dying for their faith and the battle that we are in it because of Christianity. Now the world itself always thinks about a great party, especially at this time of the year, and they're doing everything they can to try to push the name of Jesus backwards. They don't like to hear the name. We hear what's happening even in our schools today, and we know that they don't want us to have prayer. We, they don't want us to have our Bibles anymore. They, I, I was so surprised not long ago, a little five or six year old girl, probably taught by her mother and daddy, to take her little New Testament to school with her. But she was stopped by one of the teachers and said, we don't bring our Bibles to school. Another woman was praying in a mall like Florence Mall, and you've been to malls all over the country. Lady got her lunch together she went out in the food court and she just simply was bowing her head and thanking God that she had food that day. Someone walked over to her and said in this public mall, we don't pray like that anymore in our schools. We've seen those things happen time and time again. And it hasn't been just the last couple of years. I can remember when I was asked to speak for a group of people, about two or three hundred, and the Lord blessed, we had a great time, and a man walked up to me after I finished speaking, and he said, we're gonna invite you back. In fact, we'd like to make you one of our main speakers through the years. I said, if the Lord leads, and then they asked me to pray before we ate. And after we ate together, the same man came to me and said, Reverend Hooten, we want you to come back, but we never want you to pray 
and mentioned the name of Jesus again. I said, I'm sorry. Don't invite me back because if Jesus is not invited, I don't want to come. But now that's been a few years ago, but I've seen the sweep of don't you even pray in Jesus' name. It makes me almost laugh sometimes when I realize some of these people trying to get rid of the name of Jesus. Uh, I'm just going to read you one verse and you can look at it when you go home. It's found in the third chapter of Genesis going all the way back. God is speaking to the devil and he said, I'm going to put enmity, enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. We know that a woman does not have a seed. She has an egg. Almost at the very beginning, God said there will be one that will bring enmity between you and Mary and between her seed and your seed. Where did that seed come from? It's God's seed. Don't take it for granted when you read that she was a virgin and gave birth to Jesus. It was prophesied at the beginning of your Bible that it would be her seed, yet it was God who planted that seed. Don't take it lightly when a preacher might say something about virgin birth, and I've run across these, these preachers in northern Kentucky a few times. I was holding revival in a church in northern Kentucky, a good-sized church. We had a tremendous meeting, but uh, the preacher said, do you really believe those things? I had mentioned something about Jonah. And he said, you honestly believe that? I said, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't preach it. I'd give up preaching. Well, we, we had a, a good discussion about that and the virgin birth too. But I really, I wouldn't be preaching today if I didn't break, believe in the virgin birth. But my message is simple today. But it's like when I hear about some of these men, and there was a big billboard, I think, around Nashville, Tennessee, all I want for Christmas is the fact that I don't want to go to church and hear anything about God. Now, how much does it cost to even get a billboard like that? Year after year, and it's going to get worse before it ever gets better. But, you know, I believe and I'm beginning to see that we're going to experience a revival in our nation. I really believe that. And I know you're looking for a preacher today. I, I get calls every day. Uh, I'll tell you one thing had a call that uh, somebody asked if I could recommend somebody for their church. And I said, what are you looking for? Well, I tell you the truth, we're looking for a man that, that, that would preach like Billy Graham. I said, most churches would like to have Billy Graham as pastor. Well, yeah, we'd like for him to have about 40 years experience now. It doesn't matter whether he's been to seminary or not. As long as he's had experience. And I said, well, how old do you want him to be? Oh, about 45. I said, did you hear yourself? You want him to be about 45, but 40 years experience? Well, I would qualify for that. Why don't you consider Brother Hooten for that, that church? But I, I still remember, and I'll share before I run a rabbit too far, but uh, I had this woman call. I was on the search committee in my church in Louisville. This woman called and said, uh, Brother Hooten, I understand you're on the search committee. And I said, yes. And she said, we're looking for a pastor. And I'd like to recommend a pastor to you. I know you're looking for a pastor. And I said, yes, we have about 100 resumes. And we, we don't know where to go and who to talk to. And she said, I, I'm recommending one man who is a great, great preacher. Oh, he's a tremendous preacher. And she went on bragging about this man. And I said, you certainly know a lot about this man. He said, oh, yeah. He's been our preacher for years, and I think it's time for him to go. <laughs> We'd like to recommend him to you. <laughs> well, beloved, uh, I want to make it very simple this morning. I'm sure if I ask you anything about Abraham Lincoln, you would say, even young people would say, well, Brother Hooten, he was the 16th president of the United States, and that's true. But what a lot of people don't know was the fact that he was preparing the State of the Union address, and he had gone into another room, and his little boy 
was in a casket and they were going to have a funeral for him in just a few days and the Secretary of State, I, I think his name was Stewart, but I'm not for sure about that, but Abraham Lincoln went away by himself for a while and, and when he came back, he said to the Secretary of State, my great desire as the President of the United States is to find out where God is in order that I might be on God's side and lead our nation to be on God's side because God is never wrong. Wouldn't it be great if our presence today would do that? Say, I really want to find out what God's will is for my life and our nation and lead our people in that direction? Wouldn't it God one of these days we'll have a president like that? But that's what his desire was. A few years ago, I had somebody come up to me and I used that statement one time and they said, I think you're right. If, if somehow or another we could just get God on our side, why, we would be a great people. And I said, you didn't understand me. There's a big difference between trying to get God to be on your side and finding out what God's will is for your life and trying to be on his side. Do you see the difference? I don't care where you look in the Bible. You'll find that in the Old Testament and New Testament, God shared his will with them and they had to either make a choice, a decision, or a commitment of their life. Simple. Even Adam and Eve knew God's will for their life. And I look at the, the Bible and I see the rich young ruler who heard Jesus talk about his will for his life. And as far as we know that he's in hell today because he wasn't willing to follow what God's will was. I look at Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night, as the scripture says, and Jesus simply looked at his heart and said, you need to be born again. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know how in the world a man would enter into his mother's womb a second time. And he said, no, you're talking about a physical birth, but I'm talking about a spiritual birth. You need to be born again if you expect to live eternity in heaven. He evidently didn't make a decision that night, but... When Jesus was crucified, he and Joseph asked if they could take down his body and bury it properly. He put his life on the line by asking permission to do that. But nevertheless, he made a decision and he made a commitment of his life. I look at Judas Iscariot. My goodness, how many times did he walk with Jesus? And I, I've always imagined in my mind sometime when they would be out maybe in a wheat field and they weren't going to go any further, but uh, Jesus would look into the sky and would name all the stars and maybe the planets too. Judas knew the will of God, but he loved money. He wasn't willing to make a commitment of his life, and consequently, the Bible says he went to hell. He went to his own place. I look at the Philippian jailer who had been told, if you let anybody escape, you'll die in their place. When the earthquake came, all the doors of those cells were open, and it was dark, and it was night, and the Philippian jailer pulled out his sword from his scabbard and laid it against his belly, and he was ready to take his own life. But the Apostle Paul said, do yourself no, no harm. We're all here. We haven't escaped. Well, he said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus came into his heart and life when he was witnessed to by the Apostle Paul. He and his household were baptized that night. See, they made a commitment of their life. And I think the text today is just as relevant today as it was when Moses made that particular statement to those people. You see, Moses had been called up to the mountain to receive what we would call the Word of God. Moses is responsible for writing the first five books of our Bible called the Pentateuch. And he also received the Ten Commandments. But while they were there, they looked around and Moses had been so long 
They said, you know, we need to have a God that we could look at like the other nations around here. And Aaron, who happened to be Moses' brother, was asked if he would take the gold and make them a God that they could see and they could worship. And if they had to move, they could carry their God with them. And the Bible says that Aaron went ahead and took their earrings and their necklaces and their anklets and put all the gold together and he was a great craftsman and it wasn't long until they had their little golden calf called Baal. Moses was still up there receiving the word of God and of all things these people got naked and evidently they were having an orgy, a sexual orgy. And you can imagine how Moses felt when he was carrying the tablets down. And you've seen the Ten Commandments more than once by Cecil B. DeMills. And when he looked down and saw all the nakedness and all the sex and lasciviousness, all these people, he was angry. And the Bible said he threw the tablets down. He was disgusted with those people. Why is it that people are so superstitious that they want something in their pocket. It may be, may be a pocket knife. I don't have mine, but I had a fella come to me at my church one time and said, I've got a good case knife, and I want to give that to you, but you've got to give me some money for it. And I said, why? He said, well, if I give it to you and you don't give me any money, our relationship will be severed. I said, keep your old knife then. I'd like to have a good case knife. He said, well, if that's the way you feel about it, I'll give it to you then. And he did. I wonder how many of you might have a, a rabbit's foot in your pocket thinking it's going to bring you good luck. Didn't do the rabbit any good, did it? <laughs> Run around with three feet or maybe two. I had a good friend, an executive for General Electric. He was in charge of the washer-dryer division. They were sending him to California, as I recall, and he was going up the steps at Stanford Field, getting ready to fly, and he reached down, and he looked in both pockets, as he told me, but he didn't have his lucky silver dollar. This man was so superstitious, he walked down the steps, and he was going to miss his flight, and he got a taxi cab to take him home, just so he wouldn't get on a plane without a silver dollar. Beloved, don't be that superstitious. God controls our destiny. Not a rabbit's foot or not a pocket knife or not a, a coin that we think is going to control our whole life. But that's the way nature is, to be sure. Oh, beloved, I tell you, when they were worshiping like this, it reminds me of reading about some of our, our rock and roll Singers, I didn't know this, but I picked up an article one time and they said in order for them to yell and maybe hit the high notes, they will put razor blades on the inside of their cuffs. And when they're up there gyrating and moving, I move pretty good for a bad knee, don't I? Up there gyrating, they would be able to draw blood. And they even gave invitations not to come and accept Jesus, but to follow some false god. That's the world we live in this day. And God's man came down from the mountain and he was well qualified to look at these people. And I don't know, evidently he drew a line in the dirt. And he said, I'm going to ask you to make a decision or a commitment of your life right now. If you want to be on God's side, I want you to come over to where I'm standing. And it was a price to pay to be sure if they didn't. I can just see them one by one walking over saying, yes, we have sinned, but we really want to follow the leadership of God in our life. The Bible said that there were a number of people, a number of men that didn't. And over 3,000 people died that day. We think that's kind of harsh. 
But God has given us every opportunity to make a decision, make a choice, and a commitment of our life. I remember, and there, I, I remember working with Billy Graham on three different occasions. I was with him a month many years ago in Louisville, Kentucky, when we had a crusade. And he said one day, and I'll never forget it, he came out, he was about ready to go up, and he said, you know, I feel now that the greatest mission that we have trying to reach people in our own church. He said, I think 50% of the people who come to church and have their name on a roll have never been saved. 50%. That's not my word. I'm just repeating this great man who's preached to, they tell us, to more than 100 million people. But he said 50% of the people who come to church and have their name on the roll have never been saved because they have never made a commitment of their life to follow the Lord Jesus. Sure, they've joined the church, maybe followed the Lord in baptism, but it isn't long until you can't find them. And I found out afterwards when I surrendered to go preach that he's right. Do you know one of the greatest tasks a preacher has rather than preparing to preach on Sunday? Is to visit the people on the church roll and say, won't you come back? Won't you come back and worship with us and serve with us again? And I've often wondered, rather than going to see people who said they loved the Lord and committed their life to him and joined the church and followed him in baptism, they tell us right today, now, I happen to be a Baptist too, but there are over 7 million people today that didn't go to church anywhere. You can't find them. If everybody came to church that was a member of this church that loved the Lord, you'd have to sit out chairs. Wouldn't that be a great thing though? I found out something else. Whenever anybody falls in love with Jesus, you don't ever have to beg them to serve him. Don't ever have to beg them to come to worship services or to Sunday school or to get out a tithe from the, uh-oh, I've, I've touched nerve now, but to tie their money to the Lord. If they've fallen in love with him, you don't have to beg them to give to the Lord or to the mission or Lottie Moon or what have you. I was just thinking, they tell us that on an average we spent eight or nine hundred dollars a person on Christmas gifts. I wonder if we forgot whose birthday it is. I wonder how much we gave Jesus on his birthday. I used an illustration last week. I heard about two women who went into a very, very exclusive restaurant and they were so joyous and happy and the waitress or waiter came up and said obviously there's something good in your life that you're celebrating and said oh yes we're celebrating a birthday we're celebrating my son's birthday and they looked around and said they didn't see any baby and she said oh you don't think we'd bring him to ruin our good time we left him at home somebody came in the babysit and we just wanted to have a party and that's the way it is in our life. Everybody wants to have a party, but don't you ever invite Jesus to his own birthday party. Don't get him a gift. We'll tip our hat sometime. Say, y'all, I'll come to church. What is it, beloved, that God's looking for in our life? If you listen quickly, I'll tell you. God is always looking for a person that's not ashamed of him. You remember when the death angel was coming over in Egypt when these people were living in slavery. God's man said, I want you to remember that unless you heed what I say, the firstborn child, whether Egyptian or Jews, will die unless God sees the blood. Where did he ask for the blood to be placed? On the doorpost. He said, put a little dab of blood here and a little dab of blood there, a little dab of blood there on the outside of the doorpost so when the death angel comes, 
they'll see the blood on the outside, not on the inside of the house. If you're my child, don't ever be ashamed of me and tell your neighbor you've looked at the lamb and you've cut the lamb's throat and you've taken the lamb that represents a sacrifice one day of Jesus and put it on the outside. I was sitting in my office getting ready to go preach one morning. I always had a custom that I would meet with the deacons and pray with them before we would come into the sanctuary and telephone rang and a woman rather nervous said oh brother Hooten now they didn't come to our church but she said oh brother Hooten my mother died and would you have her funeral wanted me to come to chambers and grubs as I recall and I said well call me back tonight and I'll try to work it out and you tell me when the funeral is going to be this week and uh, she called me back and she said, have you started working on my mother's funeral service? And I said, no, not really. I, I'm preaching again tonight and I haven't had time to think about it, but I will. So I had her funeral, I believe Tuesday or Wednesday of that week. And I will never forget, we were coming, we'd already laid her to rest, did my best to reach the people. But when we were walking from the casket back to our cars, she looked at me and she said, Brother Hooten, why didn't you talk more about my mother being in heaven? I said, do you think your mother is in heaven? Well, she joined the church when she was little. I said, was she a Christian? Well, she was baptized. I said, was she a Christian? And she started going on. You see, I had read the paper like you. I had read this woman's name in the, in the uh, newspaper that she had been sitting on a stool with her other drinking buddies and got up that afternoon and was walking over to the front door. And as she took the doorknob to go out, she dropped dead. I said, well, tell me something about your mother. You told me she was a child and she joined the church and she was baptized. How many years has it been since you've seen your mother go to church? About 35. 35 years? Yes. I said, does it sound like your mother loved Jesus? I said, I wouldn't hurt you or anyone for the world. When I have a funeral, I try to reach people who are listening to me. I can't change the destiny of that person who lived. But in your own confession here, do you really think that your mother loved Jesus? In 35 years, you said you never saw her go to church. I said, I don't want to criticize your mother, but God's word says, if we've been saved... We're going to be faithful. No matter what happens at church, we're still going to church at least somewhere. Oh, I tell you, people get hurt. I know I went through that with my family. I went to pick, and I was pastor of the church. My wife went by after church to pick up our son from the nursery, and he was crying. And when she looked at his arm, he had teeth print all over his arm. And she went back in and she said, what in the world happened? I said, well, he wasn't too good today in, in our nursery. So I just bid him to make him show you can't touch anybody else. You have to be good. Oh, my goodness. You know, you've seen these old sad irons. Psst, psst, psst. When I got in the car, that's the way it was. There was a sad iron. And she said, I'll never go to church again. I said, but I'm pastor of that church. It's going to look funny, me going in to preach and you staying home. I, I won't go to church. If we have a worker that will bite my child like that, I couldn't do anything. Just pray with her and let the Lord deal with her. Finally, she came back to church. But she was a child of God. Even though she'd been hurt, just like some of you have been hurt, you don't want to go to church here or church there. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, the scripture says. 
He's looking for a committed people. What else does he look for, Brother Hooten? He's looking for people who are consecrated. I think the best example we get is if we see maybe a man riding a horse and he has a flag and he's going to war. He doesn't have a gun, but he's got a flag. That's consecration. I was leading in a revival over here a few years ago and I gave an invitation and who should come but the minister of music of the church. And I thought, that, oh, that was beautiful. He set an example and he said, I'm just turning over my life completely to the Lord. Whatever he wants me to do, I'm willing to do it. I, and I said to the pastor, that's a very noble thing for the minister of music to do on your staff. That was Monday. On Tuesday, I went out to eat dinner with the pastor, and we were driving to the church for the worship service, and there was a car that passed us going out, and when I looked at him, I said, isn't that your minister music? Yeah. I said, is he wearing a ball uniform? Yeah. He's got a ball game tonight. I said, but last night he came before the congregation and said, I'm rededicating my life to the Lord and whatever he wants me to do, I'm willing to do it. I said, how do you reconcile the fact that here's the man who's supposed to lead the singing of our church, but he's going to play softball tonight? God's looking for people who are dedicated, consecrated, and committed today. Where are you? Where do you stand in the kingdom's work this day? I, I've been disappointed so many, many times. I, I look at some of the statistics and they say, even us as Southern Baptists, only eight out of a hundred will ever attend a worship service on Sunday morning. What is it? Well, Lord, it's, we just say, I like to deer hunt too. And we don't have that many weeks to deer hunt. I'll tip my hat to you and I'll come to church but I'd rather I'd rather go this Sunday and stand in a tree stand looking for that big buck that's not commitment that's not consecration I tell you beloved I want you to turn your Bibles if you will please I want you to turn to John the second chapter please Matthew Mark Luke and John John the second chapter look almost the end of the verse they were having a revival like we have revivals in the 23rd verse it says now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day many believed in his name when they saw the great miracles that he was doing but look at the next verse. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew their hearts. He knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man because he knew what was in man. In other words, he knows our heart. It, they found here was a man that could feed them. And there were 5,000 that gathered together and he fed all of them and they had food left over. We need somebody like that. We need somebody on the throne to fight our battles. Let's believe in him. And many believed in him. But he said, no. A commitment of your life is a reciprocal thing. You put your faith and trust in me and I will impart my Holy Spirit to live in your heart and life. That's the way it's done. And that's the way God wants it. And what's the third thing that God is looking for? I think he's looking for people who know that they have been saved by the precious blood of Jesus. I, I think we, we feel sometimes, I've talked to so many, that one of these days when we get to heaven and we look up and we see Jesus walking toward us, that it's such a common thing we're going to walk up and slap him on, on the back of the shoulder and say, how you doing today? How you doing? Oh, that isn't just another person. That's Jesus. That's God's son who for six hours was nailed to a cross and bled his life away in order that we might be saved. No, I don't think we're going to go up and slap him on the shoulder and say, man, thank you for this. 
I think it's going to be falling on our knees and say, Dear God, dear God, thank you for coming into this world and dying for me. Dying for me. You remember in the Lord's Supper, the only thing he said, this do then remembrance of me. What? Remember that I died for you. That was my blood when you drank that. Representative of my body when you take the, take the bread. It took the death of my son for you to come to heaven. I could preach for days, I guess, about my love for the Lord, but I'll say this in closing. Robert Ingersoll was a man who did not believe the Bible. In fact, his famous lecture was the mistakes of Moses. And he would come into his lecture hall and I'm understanding that they, they would give him a thousand dollars to give his famous lecture on the mistakes of the, of the Bible and mistakes of Moses. And he gave his famous lecture how people couldn't believe a lie like that. And then he finished his great lecture and he looked at the congregation and he said, I dare you say that you're a follower of Jesus. And he looked over this side and he said, would you, would you stand up if you believe in Jesus? And not a soul stood. And he looked in the back, did the same thing all the way around. Finally looked in the choir, I mean in the balcony and said, is there anybody up there that after you've heard what I've said about the Bible would stand for Jesus? Not a soul. And he started laughing. And he, he said, I knew you wouldn't when you heard, heard the mistakes of the Bible. And he was just bragging about himself. And finally, a, about a 14 or 15 year old girl stood in the balcony and she started singing. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross. And then her girlfriend stood up with her. Man, a woman stood up in the balcony and then somebody on the first floor. People started st standing up all over the congregation. And they started singing with her. And it just got louder and louder. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross. Robert Ingersoll ran out the side door because there were so many that stood and said, I'm not ashamed of him. Only because a young lady stood up and said, I'm not ashamed of him either. We're going to stand together and sing. Don't know whether I'll ever get to see you again or preach to you again. I don't know the Lord's will for the future. But I want you to imagine there's a line drawn from where you're sitting to where I'll be standing here. And the same challenge that M Moses gave these people. If you are for God, would you step across that line and come and stand by me? We've come a whole year. You're facing a new year. Some of you need to come and say, Brother Hooten, I need to be baptized. I need to give my heart and life to Jesus. Realize it now, honestly, I've never made a commitment and a decision of my life or a choice. But this morning I'm coming. And some of you are going to come and say, you know, I need to be a member of this church. I need to be a part of the fellowship. And I'm coming to transfer my letter. Would you stand together right now, please?